we're on the way to visit Porter Geske, a buddy of mine here in Baltimore, who is kind of a mad scientist of coffee. He's been building his own espresso machine, and he's got what he, I think he calls it the Franken machine. So I've always been kind of curious. He likes to tinker with all kinds of things, espresso. And so he called me up and was like, hey man, why don't you come check out my setup? I was like, yeah, I'd love to come check it out. So we're on the way to go check out Porter's setup and uh, maybe do a little coffeeing. Stay tuned. All right, here we are. We are now at Porter's place and into the coffee. What, do, you, do you have a name for the coffee domain? This is really our mudroom. We use it for organization and sort of the family, you know, we store a lot of stuff in these drawers, but it's the last room before you go outside. So it's kind of the room that you get ready to go. Oh, so you can grab a coffee on the way out. Yeah, as well as your wallet or keys or stuff like that. Oh, nice, so. no money, coffee, keys, yeah. good, good. Okay, so what is going on in here? Well, I inherited a machine that was kind of half built. It came to me as pieces and um, I cobbled together this machine. It's a Conti made in Monaco. It's a twin group. I just actually got the second group put on. I went for years without the second group. And uh, our friend Matt, who's outside, helped me weld together this frame, which is made of uh, big box store uh, iron steel. Oh, so just angle iron you picked up from, or whatever iron. I did some research on what these machines look like, you know, commercially available. And I was able to recreate it on, in CAD and once I had the CAD file, I made a mock-up out of cardboard and foam core just to make sure that the boiler was going to fit and everything, where the pieces were going where I thought they should. Really important because it only the boiler only mounts in four places, and I really wanted to make sure that those dimensions were correct. And once I knew that, I brought a bunch of steel, and then I cut them all, and I went over to Matt's house, and I said, Matt, I have a prototype, I have some drawings, and I have some steel. Do you mind if we weld this together? And he was like, oh yeah, this is all, it's already pre-cut, he says to me. And I'm like, yeah, it's already cut. And he's like, oh, this is just like putting peanut butter and jelly together. At that point, it's just, you're making a sandwich. You had already had these cut by the, the box store? I had cut them myself okay. here outside um, using an angle grinder, other various tools. He was kind enough to sort of put it together for me. And then over the next couple of months, I just kept sort of evolving, you know. And then everyone that I talked to about it said, Leave it as it is. It's, you know, it's fantastically ugly and functional, but yet steampunky and all about, you know, being able to see inside the boiler, the machines. You always see them and they're all, you know, stainless steel, right? And this is obviously not. So is the boiler itself brass? It's a copper boiler. Uh, it's just oh, wrapped copper. in insulation because I think that keeps the heat use really down. I put a PID on it and you can see it flashes every now and again showing you that how much energy it's actually using it doesn't seem to be flashing at all right now because it's been on for hours so do you leave it running or do you i generally run it you know between two to four hours five hours a day i turn it off about now because we don't drink a lot of coffee in the afternoons there was a guy just recently you know how i got the second head i had a blank puck just sitting on it like this to blank off the second group head uh, for a couple of years and finally i found somebody selling a second head that matched the other one so I said okay I'd love to have the second head so I'm one step closer to making the machine be more complete. But what else is missing then now? Really just panels to enclose it. So you would like to enclose it at some point? I do. The effort hurdle to do that is fairly high so I'm, I'm reluctant to jump into it. I, I haven't decided yet whether it should be metal or Lexan or wood or you know, I haven't found the best material to enclose it. Plus I have this is an issue. These pipes are obviously outboard of the frame. I got some pipes over here that are outboard of the frame. So plumbing and fixing would be an issue. The switch for it is hidden back here. That's outboard of the frame. So it would take a lot of, you know, custom work to get it to fit all together. So it's not ready for you, UL certification. That's <laughs> no, certainly not. <laughs> no. This is awesome though. Look at this thing. I was able to bend the pipes in many cases where I thought the boiler only has so many inputs and outputs but and I'm sure this isn't the way that Conti meant them to work but I was able to bend some pipes and get get it to work the way I wanted it to or just as soon as it was functional I kind of stopped you okay. know what I mean 
soon as I got it up and working and running, stopped all the leaks, made some coffee out of it, I was able to just sort of say, well, I think I think this project's done for so a while. So you got the steam and the the hot water tap have their own have their own force on the boiler. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. This is. These are always dangerous, right? They always come out at 100 miles an hour. Oh yeah, well, they're under heavy pressure. I put uh, this uh, shower, like a bar rinser here. I saw that, very nice. That kind of rinses over here into the sink. Well, thank God I have the sink right here because it makes the whole espresso machine possible. Underneath here I have a water softener. Okay. That feeds the boiler um, with some nice water. So. The times I've opened it up and looked inside the boiler, there's zero scale in there. Oh, so right, at least right. I know I'm doing the right things for not allowing minerals to get into the boiler. So is there a pump? Somewhere? It's not pump driven, it's just house pressure. So you're only getting what, four bars? Well, the I spring mean, four, yeah. is what delivers. Oh, right, right. So, oh, yeah, sorry. Got Jay, it. come on. I, forget. <laughs> I keep forgetting. I'm looking at a, uh, at a uh, lever machine. Yeah, they're silent. You know, this is there's no pump. It's all just <laughs> driven off of boiler. That's boiler pressure. Okay, okay. And then uh, there's a giant spring inside here to do, you know, the rest of the pushing. This is really, what is interesting, I think one of the experiments that we can play with today is that this side has a weaker spring, the original spring. This side has an upgraded spring. So I think this is about six or seven bars, and I think this is more like eight or nine bars. Oh. So we can taste coffees that are made the same way from two different spring pressures and see if we can make a difference in our palate. All right. All what right. do you think about that? That sounds great. Right. So why did you decide to go with PID? I never really liked the pressure stat system. I thought that the dead band in there was really kind of, it was the best they could do at the time, but they didn't certainly have PID at the time this machine was created. It makes a whole lot more sense to have the PID. It flat lines really nicely, fairly quickly, and you can push button the exact temperatures. But when you, when you get the, uh, I, I, the question is like for me, if, that I'm curious about is, when you have PID, it's, it's of course maintaining a, a steady, constant temperature, but in a home application, do you really need that? I think- What's the advantage there? I mean, so if you, if you pull off a lot of heat from the machine all of a sudden, say you go through a steaming cycle or you make three coffees quickly in a row, I think the PID has a quicker ability to return to stasis, return to normal temperature than say like a pressure stat would. Um, I also, I think, I don't really love the whole clicking on and off, using a bladder valve that deals with pressure. I think your dead bend in there is really big in terms of temperature fluctuation. And the PID seems really down to the digit of, of Fahrenheit, single digit Fahrenheit you know, calculations. And like, I came to you a, lot, a while ago and borrowed your, borrowed your SCASE device and I've done repeated experimentations on like, what temperature does the PID need to be to get the right value of water temperature through the heads? And I mean, today we can verify those things with our pellets or with a ther with another thermometer or you can come back with your scase again and okay. I just feel like the PID does a better job overall and it seems to me like it uses less energy. Okay. And this boiler, what size is it? Do you, do Huge. You know? I don't even know. Okay. Five liters? Seven liters? So I, at this size boiler, do you really it's see an a, lot absolute, of, a lot of depth? It's absolute overkill. This is a okay. sledgehammer to drive thumbtacks. It really <laughs> is. I don't... I didn't intend to have such a giant machine. This is what came to me and I was sort of like, I think I can fit this in my house. It's 220 volts. There was a dryer. This was a laundry room. Okay. There was a plastic sink here. There was a washer and dryer here. And the 220 volt hookup is just behind this bench here. And I was able to have an electrician come and change the plug a little bit so that this machine could go right into the wall. So didn't need to run a whole new line, just needed right, to change right. the plug. As long as you had enough amperage running through the line right. anyway. When you got the machine, was it just the boiler and the group head or was it actually it was, a machine? It was these valves, um, it was the site valve hookup, and then a group, the boiler, the element in the boiler, and that's about it. And yeah. How, how did that even come to you? That, that, that's the part that... I got in touch with a guy who lived in Seattle, who lives in Seattle, I think he still lives there, and he was like, I have parts of a machine sitting on my shelf, would you like them? And it came, you know, the price was really um, agreeable, 
And I said, well, this looks like an experiment, you know, a project in the making. I'm kind of DIY. I love projects like that. I build old motorcycles and old scooters or furniture or anything that you can take apart, put back together, I'm, I love. One more question with the PID. You've got, you've got it set here at 255. The offset from inside the boiler, wherever it's measuring, is... And it's delivering, what, 200 to the group head? Or? Yeah. It seems high to me, value only. 255 seems really high. I've heard people keeping it at 220 or 230 and being able to get great coffee from that. Um, so that has me concerned that I could be off. But like I verified it with your skase. I verified it with a couple of years worth of coffee drinking. We make really, what I think is really great coffee. So... Part of me says, if you know, ignore the fact that it's 255, go with your palate, right? Yeah. But it is dipped, it, the, the actual temperature probe is in the water of the boiler. It's reaching far down in there with a very good thermocouple. Um, I mean, I, even I trust in Amazokos, it. there's a big difference between the Here's your pressure value right here. We're at the upper end of what is considered to be normal boiler pressure. The only other thing that I have that we can concern ourselves with today is that when I do this case temperature readings if the machine sits for a while and I just use the case device and, and hook it in and make pull a, a shot it's the the values I get off of it are low they're 195 193 and it's not until I actually like flow a whole bunch of water through the heads that I can get it up into the 198 to 200 range where I would like it to see it all the time so my general theory about making coffee these days is to flow water through the heads and then hook it in and make coffee, and I feel like that makes well, a better much, shot. Well, how much how much water is in it is in one of the heads? Do you think it's about a fifty-five milliliter shot that you get every time you pull the you know every shot you're going to make is going to be the same. Okay. If you let it flow all the way to the end. And at, so, at, but at this point, is there water sitting inside? No, it's being blocked the by the piston. The piston okay. kind of holds it. Like, I think the water travels across through this little neck here. Yes. And it doesn't really come across until the neck is kind of right there. So the piston is now rising up. And you picture it like a very, it's a very small hole. It's like a one, two millimeter hole that all the water is coming from the boiler across. So oh. it's filling up a little chamber in there as the, when the piston is up. And then when you release the piston, it blocks the water from the boiler and pushes the coffee into your cup. But that would also mean that there's water inside this neck here. Is that correct? This bridge? Kind yes. Of neck. So that's probably what's... Right. You're, it's you know, cooling itself off cooling as off. you do it. So, you know, if you're in a cafe setting and you're doing back to back to back, I wouldn't worry about it. But for me, where I make a coffee, you know, once an hour or so, it would be advisable to pull more water across mm -hmm. right you that would that's a believable hypothesis absolutely right absolutely yeah. all right so how did you get into coffee like what brought you to this level of, of psychosis um you know when i moved here it was 15 years ago and i knew about your cafe in the towson library right okay. it was in the bridge or that's the commons correct. or whatever and I tried, to, I tried to go there and have coffee there, and I thought the product was really great. And I went to a various other coffee places around here, and I, didn't, I couldn't get a good cup of coffee no matter where I went. And so I started, you know, I tried pour-overs, I tried French press, I tried Bialetti's. I'd come from New York where we used a Bialetti almost every day. And getting good coffee in New York is pretty easy. But here it seemed to be next to impossible. <laughs> so I set out on, like, I had a Sylvia... Right, and then I had another weird Spanish machine, and those two didn't really seem to do the trick for me until finally I came upon this machine about five or seven years ago. So were those smaller like the Sylvia's, was it just a matter that just didn't have enough oomph for you, is that? I saw the flaws of the Sylvia being, you know, you have to flip it over to, to do a steam to make milk. So every time you're, you're over temperaturing, and then you're under temperature, and then you're flushing it, and then you can't make two back to back, and so, it has its inherent problems. I gave it to my dad. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, he's ac actually has graduated onto another machine as well. So uh, we both have learned our, our ways through the Sylvia. But really, for me, the grinders have been, you know, very important in terms of really great coffee. If you really want a great coffee, focus less on the machine and focus more on your, on your grinder. 
And That's, so what grinder do you have here? This is a Ma Mazur Major. It's, uh, I think they're 83 millimeter burrs flat. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've been using that for a couple of years. It's a, it, you don't do anything to it. You just run coffee through it. it. It's just wonderful. Now, why do you keep with the Mazur when there's all this niche and I, all these fellow and I all these I think those are, those trends will come back to being like, you want something that delivers it, for me, it's about the RPM. I understand the value of overheating coffee through high RPM. This is kind of in the middle ground for RPMs. I, it's just a workhorse, and it came to me cheap, so I, you know, I purchased the major. I had a Super Jolly before, and I gave that to my dad. I just don't like how long it takes. They're loud. And they're slow. And they're slow. Uh, this one burns through coffee in about six seconds, so I like the fact that it is robust like that. Yes, another thing that's a sledgehammer for driving thumbtacks. And so you made modifications to this as well? The, yeah, the Mazar. with the 3D printing that I wanted to show you, um, I made my own funnel. Um, this is the, you take this off so that you can sweep the grounds out of the funnel shape. Um, and I've kind of customized this. This is a piece of cork that's kind of glued and taped on just to prevent fines from going everywhere. But there's magnets here and there's magnets on the underside and it kind of just clicks together and um, with the funnel and a little landing pad for it, it just kind of perches there while it grinds. Oh, nice. So the landing pad is just from press board? Yeah, this is cork covered uh, uh, plywood underneath it. And was there a reason for the cork? It, it's nice because it doesn't, it has the right amount of, it just sits nice. Okay, okay. And then also the handle you designed yourself? I, I wanted to learn how to use a wood lathe. I'd never really been good. I'd never really been experienced with wood lathes. And so I sat down with a piece of mahogany and figured out how to do, how to work the wood lathes. This thing too is another one of my, because I did that when I did this. Mm -hmm. And then I made these little uh, egg shaped egg shaped nodules for the handles. They were like 10 minutes. This was, this was practice. Mm -hmm. That one was third, and this one was the last one, much more refined. Oh yeah, you can actually you can see. <laughs> you can see difference. with my lathe progress was like really bad. <laughs> that one's okay, and then this one's like, oh, he's he obviously gets it. He's getting it. But why this big bulbous? I just think it really feels nice in the hand. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I designed housewares before I moved down to Baltimore, and I um, I designed a lot of knife handles for cookware, cooking, and a lot of, like, just kitchen gadgets, whether it was whisks or egg beaters. I did a fair amount of, like, just handheld tools for the kitchen. And I really got into ergonomics about the hand, and I know that this bulbous shape, as long as, and you have this little fin off here to just to sort of prevent you from slipping off the back. I whipped it up in 20 minutes, and huh. it just made sense to me. I kind of want to just take off the end, because I think it doesn't really need it, but okay. This is all. It's just a work in progress. As time goes by, I make changes. This is the original Conti head, um, and it screws off. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting that they chose that for their shape. Fairly straightforward, pretty basic. I don't know which one you like better. I don't think that I don't think the Italian manufacturers, especially in the earlier generations, were that concerned concerned about. They just put a handle on it and called it a day. Yeah. But you were just with Mr. Scase, and he had that crazy, that has like a clamp, and it has like a yeah, handle. Yeah, it has, it's got a spade handle. Yes, right, right, right. you actually right, right. pull you, this lever. You pull the lever up, and then and you down. Pull it. Well, what that does, it's, there's a cog in here that actually grips one of the, I the gears, so you can select how much... Volume. volume. Is it volume? Can, yeah. Is that what that selection is? I think so. I, I've only used it like twice. Hmm. Hmm. Well, all right. All right, let's 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 have some coffee then. Let's have okay. Some. We'll make a coffee for you. And you roast your own coffee too? I do. This is this is not my own roasted coffee. It, this is just something I bought in the grocery store, but um, it'll do for today. And what's the story behind the scale? Any any particular reason for this one? Or uh, when they break, I buy a new one. Why not like the Akaya? Some. Proper scale for home enthusiasts. I don't need the bells and whistles, a, a Bluetooth scale. I, I just don't see the value in, in that. Okay, so explain this this contraption. Just what is, what is when this? You, you know, Mazers come with a giant funnel, a hopper, that uh, for commercial use. And I single dose, so I don't have any use for the hopper. And 
So what I did was I, and I won't remove this, it goes deep down into the throat of the grinder. And then this is just to prevent beans from popping out. Oh, from the popcorn effect. Yeah. So this just sort of sits up there, right? Kind of just wipe it clean. Single dose. And I, I'm, I've measured pre and post grinding and I know that it gets really close. I'm doing your WTT here. I see that. So why, what, why do you, you see what, what is that? that? It's just a wooden dowel with a couple of pieces of wire on it that just get rid of the clump. I imagine there's a bunch of home viewers that are rolling in there like, are Do, horrified by this. It doesn't need to be $35. It doesn't need to be fancy. It does, it's all function. Like, I talked to you the other day about guitar strings as, as opposed to, what did you, yours were made of like acupuncture, acupuncture needles? Acupuncture needles. Come on. Okay, so what? So you why? Okay, so why do you even use the tool? That that's that's sort of the big deal. I got into it just just to declump, just to push the grounds around. Do you find there's a lot of clumping with the muzzle? No, no. I think it. All I'm doing is distributing it through the basket. Okay. You're getting a uniform bed. Jay, you're the expert. What are you asking me these questions for? Hmm. This is your domain. I'm here to to learn and to absorb. All right. So, generally speaking. We let it go for a count of three or four. So this is your pre-infusion, is yeah. that correct? And it's dripping, so I'll let it go. And the beauty of the silence, God, I love. I hate machines that vibrate and make a bunch of motor noises. You don't like the vibratory pump? No. Ah! no. <laughs> I don't mind the uh, the rotary pumps, the ones that yeah, have, they're, they're yeah. relatively, and you can remote them. Pro-cons or whatever they're called? Yeah. I've rebuilt a Procon or two in my lifetime. You tell me, when would you... Stop? Oh yeah, you, you, you can't pull that out? Oh, that's very pretty looking. Chestnut brown? Yeah, all right, all right, excellent. This tends to be a little wet, but just the shape of the basket. Yeah, the bar the bar sink is kind of essential. The bar sink is very helpful. This is a nice piece of uh, teak that I've bought. It just sits, it just rests on the machine, holds the uh, rinser in place. Yeah, I like that. And I tilted it up on one end, which is kind of why it's cattywampus. But it, oh, to help all drainage. All the water drained down here and into the... How much we taste? Oh, nice. Be honest. It's good. It's got a good body, good thickness. I wanted to text you earlier. It's not a very bright coffee, that's no, for sure. No, it's, I think it's got some age to it. I think the beans are kind of, they've gotten stale. Over you time. think this is stale? A little bit. It's not as fresh as it could be. Oh. What I wanted to text you this morning was, I, I was going to invite you to bring a coffee that you know well. So oh, I do. Say. I did bring some coffee. Actually, this is for you. Oh. Do whatever you want with it. Really? Yeah, we don't have to drink it all. <laughs> I drink it all the time. Oh. I don't so, how would you describe this coffee in terms of it being different? This is our house plan. It's meant to be a very accessible. Oh, it, it'll. It'll. Oh, wrap. I was using the wrong end. It will. It, it's very. It's meant to be very accessible. So, chocolate notes and nuts on the finish. What more can you ask for in life? Right now you open these. I'm a scissor fiend because I don't like to have dirty edges. I have a U.S. patent on these scissors. You have a patent on these scissors? I designed these scissors uh, when I worked for that housewares company. I designed a couple of pairs of scissors, and this was just one of them. Okay, so I've got like six pair lying around the house. What's the deal with the scissors? Uh, they came to me and said we need a pair of scissors. They go in the knife block when you buy the set. You know how it slides in to the big wooden knife block? Okay. And you you could get them at like Bed Bath & Beyond for like $40. You could have a nine piece knife set and it comes with the scissors. Um, and they just needed to upgrade their scissors at that point in time. So I went out and bought the nicest kitchen shears across the marketplace. I probably had seven or eight or nine pairs. And I took all of the good designs that I liked about each one of them. And I kind of 
ignored all the bad designs that I liked, didn't like about the others, and made my own. And it opens a pair of, opens a beer bottle, huh. other, both ways. So, oh. left-handed, so right-handed, okay. upside down, doesn't matter. Either way, you can hold this in, you can hold this in, it pops beer instantly. And then um, we put a notch in it, which makes them shears, not scissors. So these are kitchen shears. And then there's a notch? The, the tax importation on shears is a lot lower than scissors. The, the, if you have them made in China, which is where these were made, mm -hmm. and you import them, the tax is very high on scissors. Okay. And so if you put a notch in it and say, oh, you can cut through chicken bone, then the tax... Oh, is that what the notch is for? The chicken, yeah, and rows, oh. you know, like stems of gardening and things like that. So these are quite old. I kind of always laughed at the face that they made. You see that? <laughs> if you cover the rest of the scissors, they make this hilarious it's face. It's kind of like a tiki face or even like the, uh, what's that? that yeah, one? it's very tiki, isn't it? It's, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the beaker face when he makes a big mess, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So this has been out in the market for a while. Oh, it? yeah. 20, 20 plus. And it's years. still being manufactured? Funny story. I was just at Cape Cod with my relatives at a family reunion and my aunt had recently bought a pair and they were exactly the same and she's like yeah I just picked these up because I knew that you had designed them and they were brand new and I went to use them and they were so much sharper than, my, than this pair. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was like wow these are really great wow, man, maybe I should sharpen. This is cool. So I have, a, I have a US patent with my name on it um, through the company that I work for. It's not my... You know, so you don't, I, get, I don't, you don't, get, you don't get royalties I don't get it. royalties. Uh, right. My name is on the patent that's it. Oh, that's awesome, though, man. That smells great. But okay, so here's a question. So I'm, what I'm curious is, since you said it was for a knife block, yes, and it was, if I remember, it was supposed to be relatively affordable. Yes, those are cheap. What kind of design changes did you, or changes or compromises, do you do to make it that affordable? Well, it has to do with the manufacturing technique and the fact that the steel was going to be of a certain type. It wasn't high-end steel, so that's probably what brought the cost way down. I think the reason they wanted to design them as shears was because of that tax implication that I described to you before. I think that... Um, I'm going to turn this finer. What do you think? you think that that's going to be a finer sure. grind than the, what I just did? Yeah. I don't know. I, I guess. Just a smidge. We'll see. Only because I'm supposed to be the professional in the room. The answer is yes. I wanted them to be... I, I know that I wanted them to be... I'm left-handed, and I hate right-handed scissors. That's a, that's a terrible thing to, to put on anybody. So universal design is really high on my list. How can you make things that are functional to the highest amount of people, whether you have three fingers or left-handed or whatever have you, or if you have arthritis? So I made these holes extra big, spent a lot of time making sure that the bottle opener was great, and uh, besides that, I didn't really have a lot to do with the blades. Um, but there's supposed to be a cover for this side like there is for that side. It's just disappeared. Other than that, no, it's, it, they're just pretty straightforward. I had no, I couldn't do anything about the mold seams being on the inside. So I was hoping that the mold seams would not show up. If you take a really good look at Fiskars, they do mm -hmm. a great job of making the mold seams not on the insides of their handles, which makes that experience so much more delightful. But they're also more expensive. They're like, yeah, three times right. the cost. Oh, I, did you note that this giant wrench on the I end here? I did see that, I did see so that. When we started using it, the whole machine would rack and tilt. And I told Matt, and he said, he, he ran up to his house, dove underneath his uh, rafters over his porch, and he pulled this out of his pile of goods. And we just spot welded it on there to stop the machine from racking. <laughs> and he's like, perfect. <laughs> and he found, he bought a bunch of tools from the Baltimore shipbuilding industry when they went out of business. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, and that's a wrench from the shipbuilding industry. <laughs> All right. So this is a coffee you know well, right? Yes. Where are these beans from? Guatemala. Fantastic. Did you ever use these automatic tampers? I played with them in the past, but I've never owned one. Yeah. Do you I, use it much or? 
I was out in Seattle visiting Starbucks for my my work, and uh, I came across it in a sort of a coffee pawn shop, and I got it for like forty dollars. Oh, cool! They're really they're super rare. They're hard to come by. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're they're not very they were not very popular. I don't think. Pick your vessel here. What would you like to have it in? Oh, since we're drinking since we're drinking my coffee, we should put it in a fancy cup. That that exactly the cup I was thinking about. Yeah, but you know, that's all right because I'm I'm being more facetious about that. Here's one without. Do you like these cups? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, being a ceramic artist as well, I think these are really well designed. I love the handle. Oh, that could be a little fast. Oh, that's fine. I've not seen a coffee cup that had the handle come off horizontally like that. I think that's a really nice touch. They're very easy to clean. Are they? They stay clean, you know. Well, that's probably good. Pull it. I'm looking for when the color changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw yeah. that. Ah. Well, here, you should try it first. Okay. See what your thoughts are on this coffee. Uh, see, this is just better coffee. I can tell already. Uh -huh. It has that deep espresso. Yeah. You tell me whether you think that's too high temperature. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> what do you think? It's good. I mean, it, it, I, I'm laughing only because it's always those times when, like, you're trying your own coffee, like a little bit. Sometimes you're a little bit surprised at how, how pleased you are with it. <laughs> so you, because you, get, you don't, sometimes you really don't know. Like, yeah, you know, you spent all this time getting the coffee ready, roasting it, doing all that stuff, but until it goes into a machine and gets made, you never really know how it's going to turn. It's a nice out. job roasting. Is that what you're saying? I'm 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 pleasantly surprised. I'm pleasantly surprised it's about balanced. how it's it, good. It has a citrusy end mm. and, a, and a deep, you know, base notes too. And to be honest with you, this is actually a coffee that's not even designed for espresso. Oh, okay. That, that wasn't the that's not the intention with the House Nation blend. It's really more about this tastes like espressos that I've had well in my past in Europe or you know just I um. Yeah, this has a very familiar flavor profile okay. that says this is what espresso should be. I'm noticing the lack of crema. The, the last one had all kinds of ch the chestnut brown colors. Well, this we've one, been drinking that. Oh, there was a bit. It disappeared. Bit, yeah, yeah. I didn't look at it when it first. Yeah, yeah. Started. There was a lot when we started. So, question for you is, what would you change if you wanted? If okay, you're in your cafe, you've just made this cup of espresso. What adjustments would you make? at the start of the day to ensure that your cup of coffee was providing your customers with excellence. If it was me starting the day behind the bar, I would probably pull at least one more mm -hmm. to see the performance and then really decide. Because this to me is solid. So I, I don't want to, I would serve that to a guest and without, without having to worry about it. Nowadays, I don't get too caught up in the whole, I must spend 45 minutes pulling 30 shots to make sure that everything's correct. I'm familiar with that chart that shows the four directions of adjustability, whether it's temperature or dosage or time. And I feel like people really get over-involved in the nuances of those, you know, those little measurements and so forth. But what you're saying is that the machine as it is, you feel is fairly well set up. So far, yeah. And my next question would be, does the lever provide a flavor profile that's vastly different from what you would expect from this coffee? Does the machine, in other words, the long story short is, does the machine make a difference? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, and I think, I don't think it makes, I don't think that there's that big a factor because what do we need to make espresso, right? We need to make, we need the ideal temperature, pressure, quantity. If all those factors are present. Yeah, what, what else do you need? Yeah, what else do you need? 
You know, the, the difference between this and, like, let's say, and I'm going to say La this Marzocco. word. Well, no, 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 forget, forget the La Marzocco, but between this and, let's say, like a Sylvia, mm -hmm. right, is... You can, if you can get everything dialed in, like on that Sylvia, to this, it should theoretically bring you similar results. It's just that it can't do that two times in a row. Right. <laughs> I and think that's the big. That's it, where the difference. This really machine happens. has very little variability. It's not how fast you pull down the lever. It's all it does is like you're pulling down the lever after it's locked in, and then you're letting the lever go, and like that's pretty. It's a pretty simple process, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Not and, and a lot really, of variability. Exactly. That's, that whole thing is a, a coffee making in and of itself is a very simple process. But we, we tend to fall into, we have to make it more complicated with different tools. And yeah, what I, I think part of my coffee journey has been a, a decrease in the variability. How can you just nail down each of the variables? Like that coffee grinder takes that equation right out of, you know, takes that variable right out. The lever is always going to be the same, um, but you can pull the shot away, right? You can right. you can pre-infuse for a little longer. So there's small vari variations there, but the pressure is always going to be the same. The volume of water or water delivered is always going to be the same. So and and the temperature is fairly stable. This is, machine has been on since you know seven o'clock this morning. So I so it's got a lot more stability inherent in it at the moment. Yeah. But you said there's different springs. Yeah. Maybe we should try a little yeah, pressure yeah, spring. Yeah, let's try a little different spring. Here. That would be this. This side is the, uh, yeah, you can just tell that this is a lot easier to pull than that one. So, yeah, we'll just switch sides. All right, all right. We'll go again. Did you feel like that was the right amount of uh, grinder? I liked it. I liked it. Okay, we'll just do 17 grams again. But in many respects, the question is, you know, if let's say that you're the end, you're the end user, how does it taste to you? Well, I'm a milk coffee drinker, so it, it I go but long periods of time between tasting espressos, and um, I think this is within you're on the you're in the bullseye target range with this. Okay, so you're it's what I would expect to taste when I taste good espresso. When you make coffee, you're always making with milk. Yeah. Okay. And typically, like a cappuccino or latte. Uh, I think I'm where, somewhere between a cappuccino and a latte. It's, okay. I fill the same amount of volume in the pitchers with milk every time, and I'm really having a. I'm on the journey of trying to make latte art with the milk. Oh, oh. I'm not very good. Oh yeah, let's see that. That'd be, that'd be interesting. Okay. 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 Yeah, Chloe and I are. Um, Trying to come up with how you know how do you make those beautiful designs on the top of your coffees? I could do some, but it's all about practice. Is it? Yeah, really. Well, yeah, yeah of course you're thinking about how to do it better, but let's just do this just for giggles. Yeah, uh -huh. appears right. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. This is the bigger, the white ones are like what, six or maybe six ounces or seven, and these are more like eights. Bigger for a coffer. Oh, for lattes. Yeah. I'm gonna flow a little water through here. Even that's lower pressure spring, it seems to do the same amount of flow, which is curious to me. Right? You I generally peel off a very, you know, good amount of water there, and then it's then it's dry. 
This is a dragon of a steamer. Look at this. That's a lot. You could fill this whole room with steam. So I put a manual ball valve um, stopcock on the back of this machine. Whenever it gets down in the mid-range in terms of sight level, I just turn on the water and it feeds house water into the boiler. And oh, then, so it's not constantly feeding. Okay. It's not an autofill, so you need okay. to keep an eye on. Oh, uh, okay. But we're just one house. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. a couple of coffees a day is not going to require a whole lot of refilling. So you don't purge. Just told me she wanted a cup of coffee. I can't really do anything. That's just generally. Oh, that's just it. generally what I do. Yeah, looks good. So our daily coffees tend to look just like that, except when I don't spill the milk. <laughs> oh, that's good effort. That's good effort. Pretty, but not really what you would call the tulip or the the fern or whatever. Most people have a very difficult time getting rosettas. Yeah. All right, I'm going to give this to her. I'll be right back. This is the daily status of, you see these people's uh, coffee stations online and it's like, they're immaculate. And uh, that's hard to uphold all the time. It's only for that moment when they took that picture. It's not like that. I'm sure it's not like that normally. You need a new group gasket for yours. I do. I got, look at them. I got waiting to happen oh, for you. Nice, nice. You tell me the size, I, I can outfit you. <laughs> see in there. Of course you have your your cleaner, extra porta filter. Here's a homemade SCASE device that I made myself out of plumbing parts. How did that work? Uh, it's just a little needle valve right here to simulate the flow of espresso uh -huh. and then I used a nylon puck and a little tiny thermocouple was sitting in the screen right there. So when you compare it to the the official version, yeah, how did they do? It doesn't work as nicely as... Oh, it doesn't? No. Okay. It gives you a... I would say it's an 80% accuracy of read, but um, it has to do with just the, the quality of the thermocouple and the instrument that you're using. Here's an early try at a porta filter for, you know, made out of wood. So you made this also? I did. Just to whipped it up on the lathe. A couple of pieces of... Also from Teak? Yeah, you can see the joints where the pieces came together. Now this is glued or you screwed them together? I glued them and then I, after the glue is dry, I just l put it on the lathe. It doesn't fit really well. Oh, you mean within the basket? Yeah, it's kind of loose. Oh, that's good enough. Yeah. This, this allows you to do the, there was, there was a time when there was an old school technique where people would tamp and then kind of do like quick small tamps in four different positions, like a cross pattern. Oh, really? If their tampers were smaller. Huh. Actually, this feels quite comfortable. It's not bad. Yeah, that's nice. I kind of like the feeling of the texture of the wood in my hand. It's really highly sanded. There's no other yeah, real goodies in here except for, uh, you know. A more Conti. Oh, yeah. this is the spring for the... the... That, so that's the new spring that I could put in here that is uprated. Wow, this and is massive. I think massive. this has a label on it. See, it says 9, so... I'm that guessing mean? that that's the, that's the pressure. Yeah, it has the specs on it, but it's from Cafe Parts. And this came when I got the group. He was like, oh, here's, a, here's an extra spring that it fits into that group in case you ever needed to replace it. So I could have them the same if I wanted to. Oh, I think, I think it's much interesting to have it different. We didn't get to taste it, though. Not yet. Well, now's our chance. Now's our chance. Do we have to make another? Do you uh, want to make it instead of me? Sure, I'll give it a try. All right, so we're gonna measure out 17 is what we've been doing. Yeah, I just put the tape on that bag. I don't need these anymore. Did you print this, uh, this? Yes, that little cup. I dig it. I want it, the reason that exists is because that's a shape that you'd never be able to make on a wheel by hand. That can only be made in CAD because of its you know, elliptical qualities. Nobody can make perfect ellipses. Okay, okay. Through lathing or milling or anything else. It's a strictly a 3D printed shape. Okay, so this goes here. With the funnel. Right. With the funnel. Right. 
Nope. Yeah. This points to uh, obvious design flaws in my process. Well, it's, it's just a matter of getting used to the workflow first. So do you have to hold your pressure down on this? No. Okay. Just sort of sit there. Kind of wiggle it to get the last. Yeah, that's it. Don't forget the extra in the throat of the. Oh. And that's right. You use this. Oh, throat. so you take this off, right? Yep. That's good. That's the only flaw with the Mazer is that it holds so much in the throat. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's one of the problems. Oh. Uh oh. Of course See? That doesn't make it. We difference. talked about that earlier, didn't we? If we do that anyway. All right. Now I should use the tool. And what what kind of pattern do you use for this tooling? <laughs> um, three times counterclockwise, then followed by a. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> One, two, three. Like really, is there a pattern that you use no. for this? No. No. I do it. Blindly. What are you trying? What are you trying to do with this? Thing? Just. To distribute the coffee evenly across the basket. Alright, I'm just making a mess in there, that's not. And then with one good slap on the table. Oh, slap. Yeah, and then you can take the funnel off and So uh, is, that, is away. that the right amount? Yeah, I think so. I mean you're not gonna go that far from although there is some spill, but I wouldn't worry about it. Sorry, I missed that tamping. Not being a good cameraman. Let me switch sides. Right, so in that flush. There's only so, so much room in this little space. So do you wait for it to stop kissing or just... No, that's it. I just do a couple of... And then I wait, once the drops start, then pull it up? Mm-hmm. some distribution problems. I didn't have those. I noticed. <laughs> I'm an amateur with the WDT tool. <laughs> How's that look to you? Looks a little bit thin. The master says. Not as good. A little bit sharper, a little brighter, but that could be technique. I don't flush that much volume when I flush. Could, is, does it taste hot? Hotter than the previous? Like, no, not, as a consequence? Not it just, oh. Tastes like you try, do you try, you, you, the, the taste difference is, quite, I think, quite apparent. Yeah. Like, oh. completely different. Yeah, that is... Wow. I think you should make the shot because you did the last one and you're more comfortable making great the coffee that I wanted it's... to I wanted to just I was taking all the fun out of it so it was great to try it but I think that if we're if we're really going to be yeah, we need comparing apples. styles apples to apples here. I just hurry up. Seventeen, thirteen. We'll just leave that one in there. What was the actual weight of the last coffee you made? They've all been 17. But I mean like 17 oh, point something? Coming out or going in? I mean and went on the scale. 17.2. Uh, this one was 17.2. Oh, see, I probably have a difference of a bean or two, but like mine was 16.98 because I didn't want to go over 17. And I wonder, like, I wonder if that has an impact. We're on. doing the low pressure side, right? Yes, please. This is fun. I didn't know this was going to happen today, but this is fun. Oh, yeah, it's good times. Good times. Thank you for coming thank over. And thank you for inviting me. No flush? Flush? Let's go with no flush. We just made a shot, so yeah, it should be hot. hot. It'll be interesting to see if there's a taste difference. Yeah, 
couple dribbles and then the shot. Eh, no spritzing. See, the spritzing's a big, that, that's a problem. That, channeling, right? That's going to be contributing to that, that flavor change. What did you taste? I want to hold off on my words before I hear yours. There's just kind of like a bright bitterness to it. At the end or at the front? Yeah. Like right now, that's what I'm tasting as a... Yeah, that's what I got too. I would stop there. That looks much better. Like if you remember, the, uh, the crema was dispersing already at yes. this point. Yeah. Here it's holding. That's really much more solid. Much What's the value solid. in that? What's your call on why that is important? Well, I, I think that's it. So what, a, what, what, what we saw from the shot pulling, right? We saw that there was um, some spraying coming. So that's an indication of channeling and uneven extraction, which I think we can taste that because it was a lot brighter. It didn't have the same balance. It didn't have the, the, the richness to it. And the crema was just dissipating really fast. So that's all part, that's all part indications of under extraction where this one, look at the, even now that we're just chatting away, the crema is relatively still very solid, even Stable. though some here yeah. that's coming apart, but. We're making a mess here. Hmm. Is it different from the previous one? Yes, yes, different from the previous one and different from this one, I think. You, you, you tell me. Oh, that's much nicer. So it's much more even tasting. It doesn't have that bop boom that the first. But it doesn't have the. There, there was a heavierness that was a, with this. There was one. a heavierness, and there was more body. Right. From the heavier spring. This is a lighter spring. You're, I don't know. I don't know the technology behind why we're tasting what we're tasting. I can only tell you. What I'm tasting. Well, I think if heavier so, spring the, leads to what? Well, the heavier spring would theoretically give us more pressure, push, right? Right. So with greater push, there's a greater extraction. Okay. Right? Higher, higher yeah. extraction yields. Somebody on the internet's gonna say, "No, you guys are completely wrong. You don't know what <laughs> But that's gonna be my assessment. At you the know moment. what I have here is I have one of those. I don't remember what the name of the device is called. A gas uh, chromatograph. Uh, no. <laughs> We should put these through a chromatograph and see what happens. It's the device that measures the extraction. Oh, the, uh, the, 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 the TDS reader? Yes, TDS. That's it. Oh, but there's, a lot, there's a lot of rigmarole to go through with espresso. Yeah, you got to put it through the, the filters. and. I don't even know where it is right now. But I, had, I, I, I walked down that chemistry path once just to determine whether I was crazy or not and I couldn't make and you thought you were crazy and right? I couldn't make heads or tails of using it so I gave up I mean it's it, those are I think those are good tools for the professional that wants to get really understand more of the extraction ratios but you know like in my role with Spro it's like Guests are not coming in with a TDS meter right, right. what right. they're coming is with their tongue and they want to be like right. this tastes great so I always believe that if it tastes great, if you can deliver great tasting coffee, people will be happy, I think. And you're bearing, oftentimes you're bearing it in this blanket of milk, which, yes. which you know, you're hiding a lot of the flaws of coffee with a whole lot of sweet milk flavors. So, um, yeah. How about one more? Okay. What, what's How about your recipe? one more on this one? Just to verify. Because I, I think that we'll, yeah, just to verify so we can see, will it be the same? As that first one we did. And, and while I'm making it, I'll propose you a question. And yes. that is that I've noticed in using this that pucks pulled from this right side, lower pressure side, are drier than the pucks pulled from the high pressure side. Just in, and it may be basket driven, it might be portafilter driven. I've tried swapping them back and forth. And just this side tends to be drier pucks than the left. And I don't know why, but I'll let you ponder that <clears throat> while I make the next. Okay, I'm going to ponder that thought. And now, I'm trying to think about, like, a, I mostly use La Marzocco linears mm -hmm. in my operations. Mm -hmm. So, that, of course, the difference is that it's pump-driven. Who are you? Well, I'm saying that it's pump-driven. And <laughs> I also, for our specification of coffee, for our espresso, we use 21 grams. 
Okay. Right. So we're really filling the basket pretty yep. heavily. So in those cases, you need a triple bath. Like I think this is a triple. Because we use the the that setup, I don't really have many times when I get a lot of this soupiness in the coffee. Right. And I think that's because we are using a lot more coffee, coffee than most people today. Do you? Do you? Prof, prof, I guess, do you advise going to 21 grams for someone like me, single dosing, you know, my couple cups of coffee a day? No, it's, do you it's, think the it's, product would be better or different? Or It's a stylistic choice, honestly. It's not really, I don't think there's necessarily one better than the other. You'll get, I think you get a little more body out of it. And if you want that, that's maybe something to experiment with. But I don't really tell people that they have to, that they should do any one way. I want you to notice that when I pull down the heavy spring, the whole machine kind of tilts a little bit. It flexes. Oh, so we need more. So one of the fixes wrenches. that I've talked to Matt about is that this, it, the metal that I bought is kind of thin gauge. It's thin stuff, and I have much more robust angled steel outside in the garage. That I'm thinking the next move is to sort of have to disassemble it, swap in a couple of pieces for much more robust pieces of iron, and that way it won't. Because look at it. it, it the whole thing moves like an inch or two, like. Right? Yeah, you need this. And so what I do is to combat that is I hold the lever, the portafilter up with this hand and kind of bring it down gently. And, it's, and you know, with metal fatigue, over time as you stress and de-stress, it just, that's what will cause to cracking and mm. the death of the metal. So Now could it also be that flexing is happening because you don't have enough there's only four points of members to Right, or? there's only four points of uh, attachment. You know, and it's kind of like the whole machine is replying upon these little tiny bolts. And so it's inherently flexible. Oh. I love the quietness of this. It just... That really is something that's quite... It's a beautiful quite thing. Quite different than most setups. You're in here early in the morning. I mean, you've already made a bunch of noise with the grinder anyway, but. <laughs> but you don't have the burn. Right. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that should be good. Right there? Yeah, why not? I'm going to let you do it. You're first. No, no, you first. Oh. I'm going to wait for it to cool. I've been. All right, very good. I've gotten a hot, hot couple of sips. Yeah, that's right back to where we were. It's very similar to what we just had off of that. So that verifies the, the spring difference for me. You taste it? Oh yeah, yeah, very it's much. Like, now we got that body back and it's yeah. a lot more. And you get the zing at the end that the back side of the note is all about citrusy, lemony, you know. That's much more enjoyable. For you, yeah, okay. That's great. So you're a proponent of the heavier spring. Yes, I guess so. I guess I would be a proponent of the Edward Spring. All so right. the good question would be like, which coffees would you roast knowing that you had a lower pressure spring? And what, what coffees would be good at a lower pressure infusion? Is it good? No. <laughs>